Welcome back to The Contrarians, everybody. We have a special episode of Showcase tonight. Um, we're interviewing Reed today. Reed, how you doing? I'm doing great, Marco. I'm flattered to be asked to do this. How are things in Toronto? Uh, we're actually kind of in the middle of a snowstorm right now. Um, by the time this goes, well, this will probably go up in a couple of days, so who knows what the weather's going to be like, but today is a snowstorm. We're recording on Thursday night. How is it in cool. your neck of the woods? Cold, damp, uh, decent January weather, though. Nothing like where you are. Okay, right on. Well, I just want to thank you for coming. Um, of course, we were eventually going to get to you. It was just a matter of time. Like, I, I eventually want to get to anybody who's interested on our Patreon and even outside of our Patreon and other channels and folks that we've kind of um, uh, joined forces with or have been kind of on the same ballpark with. So um, it's an honor to have you as a guest. You've been a supporter and a member of the Contrarians for a long time. So um, uh, this is absolutely yeah. an honor. That's true. I, I did not join immediately, but pretty close to when you started doing the patreon yeah absolutely and you've been a guest host on a number of our our shows you've been a panel member on another another of our show a number of our shows so tonight it's going to be really interesting we're going to get uh, a closer look at reed and get to know what makes reed tick are you ready i'm ready let's do this thing all right so what made you interested in music okay so uh i actually grew up I don't say in a musical family because my family didn't play instruments, but uh, a music listening family. My father was big into country music. He watched Hee Haw every Sunday afternoon. Uh, I was looking back. My very first record I ever got was when I was about six years old. Now, um, this was in the early 70s. I was a big fan of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Excuse me, Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory at the time. And it had this massive hit song, the candy man. So my mother went out and bought me an album by the candy men, completely unrelated. In fact, the candy men were a proto Southern rock band that eventually became the Atlanta rhythm section. So here I am at like five or six years old, listening to Southern rock that my mother thinks is like a kid's album. And it ends with this really bizarre song about nuclear war wiping out all life on the planet. And uh, that one stuck with me for so long that I haven't listened to that album since 1974. And that is, I was like, even the grass has died by the candy man. I bet I can find that song. And I was able to look it up. So I've been listening to music for a really long time. Um, but the things that turned me into the more or less the music fan I am today were Kiss in 1977, uh, just before Love Gun came out. I met a friend who uh, his parents had a five and dime and they sold uh, records and he was a huge Kiss fan. He also loved the Bay City Rollers and a bunch of other stuff that was popular in 76, 77. And uh, he put on the single for Christine 16 uh, as the A side and Shock Me as the B side. And then after that, it was, I can't remember, I think Love Gun was the next one that came out and uh, he bought uh, Love Gun, the album, and he had a live too. And we would also listen to Fleetwood Mac and the Steve Miller Band and whatever else was popular at that time. Um, and then I just listened to whatever happened to be on. I didn't really have any musical tastes as such. I just absorbed whatever was in the area until 1981 and probably the seminal moment of my music fandom was when I got the soundtrack to Heavy Metal, the motion picture. And that is, you know, I divide my life up to pre-listening to the soundtrack from Heavy Metal, the motion picture, and afterwards. Because before that, I didn't have any specific musical taste. I loved the Beatles. I had seen the Beach Boys in concert in 1976, loved them. Uh, you know, I loved Kiss. 1981, I was a Heavy Metal fan. Because that was when I heard Ronnie James Dio sing The Mob Rules on the soundtrack to Heavy Metal, the motion picture. And that song turned me into a heavy metal fan. And from then until 2012, uh, if it wasn't metal, I wasn't interested. I was just a confirmed heavy metal fan. And in 2012, it was like something flipped a little switch in my head. And I started listening to other rock, The Who, David Bowie, um, Oasis, Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. And now I listen to everything. 
in the rock context. Uh, I also listened to a lot of jazz when I still worked. I'm retired now. But when I worked, I listened to jazz at the office because people who listen to heavy metal at the office are obnoxious. Very cool. Wow. I, I got to look up the Candyman. That sounds it's intense. a good album. But yeah, for your five-year-old listening to this song about nuclear war is going to kill everybody. So the whole thing was you're going to crawl into your bunker and live under the grass until even that dies. I mean, that stuck. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> here I am, you know, almost 50 years later, and that song is still sticking with me. So much stuff to get into. Did you end up becoming a fan of country at all? Like, did you listen to some of the, the acts that your dad listened to? No. Uh, well, listen to them, yes, because I had no choice. Um, but enjoy them, never. Don't like country music. I don't like the country music society. I grew up in a lot of small Western towns, so I know of which I speak. Uh, I have even worked on cattle ranches. I know that's hard to imagine looking at me, but that is something I've done at the past. Um, so I have been around the country music and country music fans uh, for years and years, and I don't like it. Interesting. Does your dad know about that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's OK. He doesn't. He's the classic. He doesn't understand my music either. Um, one of my favorite factoids about my dad, just to digress for a second. Now, my dad was born in 1940, so he was a high school junior when rock and roll became a thing. Completely missed it. Wow. Interesting. So I was like, Dad, tell me stories about the birth of rock and roll. And he's like, I wasn't paying attention. That's hilarious. Were you a big fan of the movie Heavy Metal? Like, did you go and see it in the theater? Or uh, I like parts of it. I find that movie problematic. I found it problematic then. Uh, so love the soundtrack. Not a big fan of the uh, of the animation. Okay, so you weren't a big fan of the magazine then? No, no gotcha. not my, not my, not my scene. So you were you were a pretty big fan of Kiss. Uh, what were some of the right. bands that you saw live pre Heavy Metal? Hmm. So I think the only concerts. Um, the, now, most of the time I lived in small towns in the West. I lived in Utah and Montana uh, and small towns in California. So concerts weren't really a thing. So the very first concert I ever saw was the Beach Boys, which I saw in Los Angeles um, in 1976. And then in 1979, I saw Kiss on the Dynasty Tour. And I think the next concert I saw was in the 80s. I moved down into Oklahoma City in 1986. And that is really once I was able to see concerts was starting in 1986. And I think Def Leppard on the Hysteria Tour may have been my first big concert. It was Def Leppard and Tesla. Uh, I mean, not that Kiss wasn't big. That that was on the Dynasty Tour when they had the candy colored costumes. And um, that was pretty amazing. And still the only rock show that my father has ever seen. And he was, you know, I, I still say he hated Kiss with a passion. And the fact that he was willing to take his 11-year-old son to see them in concert, right on, Dad. Awesome. Um, what were some of your favorite bands post-heavy metal era? Oh, man. So for me, it was all about Dio. Uh, I love Dio. I love Dio era Black Sabbath. Um, and then it was... Whatever we could find. So I lived in a small town in Montana and it was literally um, it's just like Martin's experience as a kid. You had to go someplace two hours away or three hours away to get music. Um, so it was a question of what people would bring back into town or what we saw on MTV. So what people brought back into town were Sabotage, Iron Maiden, Rat, um, Motley Crue. There was a, at the time, what was a one album band called Warrior that I absolutely loved. They had this cheesy album called Fighting for the Earth. Warrior, Fighting for the Earth. Look it up, people. It's fantastic. If power metal had been a genre at the time, they would have been one of the very first power metal bands. Um, and then they didn't do another album for 13 years, but I've never listened to the, any of their other music. Um then loudness, I was really into loudness once I heard Rock and Roll Crazy Nights on MTV, uh, Megadeth, um, Metallica, some ACDC. But through all of that, for me, it was all about Dio. I was just so into the Dio and anything Dio-esque. And a lot of the other stuff. Oh, still Kiss. I love 80s Kiss. 
have to throw that out. Obviously, that's a, a sticking point for many of the uh, many of the fans. I love '80s Kiss more than '70s Kiss, but um, probably once you get away from Dio, probably Sabotage and Warrior and Loudness were what I listened to as much as anything. I had a friend who was the world's biggest Judas Priest fan, so I heard so much Judas Priest. Um, but I can't really say that I was a huge fan. It was just that it was it was on while we were hanging out. Were you the kind of guy that would hang around after shows and try to meet the the band members? Did you go to local shows? Were there any local bands you're into? None. I, I was never into local bands. Um, for one thing, I didn't have much money, right? So, uh, and I don't drink. So local shows are pretty much at bars. Um, and if you don't drink, bars are the worst place on the planet to hang out, right? Right. So... Um, it honestly, until I was much older, it never even occurred to me that you could hang out and meet the band. Hmm. Um, so once I got, once I was an established, you know, adult and professional and people started selling VIP experiences, I would occasionally buy a VIP experience. Um, and I met Motorhead before Lemmy died. Uh, I met Megadeth oh. and I met a few other bands. But weirdly, the only band I ever met after a show was D. Snyder's short-lived Widowmaker project. Um, that That's was right. a fast. I remember you talking about seeing them live. Yeah, that was an interesting show. <laughs> um, and I've uh, just out of the blue, because of the way I look, people always make assumptions about my lifestyle, and I've actually had band members come up and ask me if I had various substances that I could provide them, which I always thought was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. I'm like, sorry, man. And that's generally the last that they, uh, that they really care to interact. I noticed that you got a bunch of equipment in the background, guitars and stuff. Do you want to tell us a sure. bit about that collection? And is, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you at one point had a ch your own channel. And I think you talked about equipment. Is that correct? Or am I, am I mixing something up? Yeah. That is true. I'm actually not going to mention it. I've, I've let it die. Um, I haven't put out videos in a couple of years, but I did guitar pedal videos. Um, I used to build guitars, so I have 10 or 12 electric guitars that I've built. Uh, I sold probably a dozen more that I built because there's a point if you're a once you get into building guitars, it just piles up. Right. You know, what are you going to do with all of those guitars? So I kept my favorites and sold off the others and you know, uh, if you're a no name, if you're just some random schmuck on the Internet selling guitars, you're never even going to get parts what you paid for parts out of a build job. Right. It's just like any other hobby. You do it for the joy. Um, and then eventually I just got back to to buying guitars. That's a, a Yamaha uh, Revstar there at the front because um, I wanted a guitar loaded with P90s. Uh, for several years, I had a garage band. We were old man jam. I was the singer and guitar player, um, wow. and uh, I, I've got another story about a band that I'm going to save for the what's one thing people don't know about you, but I've got, geez, uh, I've got a couple of dozen guitars, several hundred guitar pedals. It's frankly ridiculous for a guy who uh, COVID killed off my garage band. I mean, just dead. We haven't gotten together to play since then. Um, I've made some physical changes to the house so we can't even practice anymore. Um, you know, we occasionally make noise about getting back together, but just, it just hasn't happened. Anybody that's in a band knows how hard it is to keep a band together, even if you're just doing it for fun. Is there any we, footage or recordings or anything? Um, no, no. I mean, I don't have any. It's possible that like friends, wives or something. We used to put on shows once a year. Um, I used to do, uh, decade themed shows. So like one year I'd do all songs from the seventies and one year, all songs from the eighties and one year cool. songs from the nineties. Um, I'm a, and I'm pretty comfortable singing and playing guitar, but it kind of drives people nuts because I don't attempt to play songs exactly as they were recorded. I'm not a, a tribute artist. Uh, and some people can get into that and some people can't, you know, it's, it was always my version of a song. And, and like I said, some people that just drives them up the wall. I'm like, hey, if you want to learn, if you want to listen to the recording, go listen to the recording. That's a different deal. 
Going back to the guitars for a second, is there a Holy Grail guitar that you have? Is there something that you're searching for in the wild? Oh, man. So once you like guitars, there's a never ending process of acquiring guitars. Um, I eventually bought a lot. I love artist signature instruments. So back there on the wall, I've got a Reeves Gabrels uh, guitar. I love Reeves Gabrels. And um, I eventually bought the bullet and body Johnny Marr Jaguar, which is, is uh, it's not even my favorite guitar, but it's my favorite acquisition as a guitar. And the thing that I look at every time he comes out with a new one is I love Megadeth uh, and I love flying V's. And I think about getting a Dave Mustaine signature flying V, but his uh, Gibson flying V's are not particularly, they don't look that high a quality to me uh, and they are phenomenally expensive. So I'm waiting until they come out with a less expensive version. Um, if there is one that I, you know, like, oh, man, I would really love to buy that. Um, I would love to have a really high end like PRS, like, the you know, the $5,000 and up models. Just it'd be like having a sports car, right? Just to have it. Do you have a Holy Grail album that you're looking for? No, I've I've so I buy music, but I don't think of myself as a music collector. Right. I don't gotcha. chase things down and acquire them. Right. Can you tell us something that we don't know about you? Yeah. So I, I've been saving, <laughs> been saving this story up. Uh, people might get a kick out of this. When I was in college, I was also in a garage band. So this is many years ago. I think this is 1987. They needed a singer. When I joined them, their name was Seventh Heaven. Uh, they were mostly a cover band. Uh, they were unapologetic hair metal guys. We did Warrant covers and Dawkin covers. Um, the guys in the band were really good. Um, the lead guitar player, Craig, I think he could have been a professional. I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, but they needed a singer. So I joined the band and they had original songs. We did, I think, five original songs. The only one I remember the title of anymore is Listen to the Thunder. Uh, and it was a good song. And one day I show up for rehearsal and they've decided to change the name. Now, I was the new guy, so I don't have any input into this sort of thing at all. And they they proudly tell me that we are changing our name to Toymaker. And it was M-A-K-K-E-R. So really Toy Macker, but it was <laughs> Toy Maker, right? And they had this, I mean, elaborate, they had this logo with the K's that faced each other in Macker. And they had a um, uh, a mascot, which was this girl in uh, like a circus costume with a, a clown face. A few years later, she would have been a Harley Quinn ripoff. But at this point, Harley Quinn was, I don't even know if she was a character in 87, but nobody knew who Harley Quinn was, like from DC Comics. So Toy Macker was a bit ahead of their time with that. Yes, yes, indeed. And I thought it was freaking ridiculous. <laughs> And uh, I made fun of it, and that did not go over well at all. So they set oh, up, sure. they set up a uh, a show at our school, and uh, one of the problems in the band was the drummer was a compulsive liar, and he also he was actually a pretty good drummer, but he had massive stage fright, and if they ever like set up a gig, he would just not show up. If he couldn't figure out a way to to weasel out of it, he would literally not show up for the gig. Uh, so they they set up a gig at the school. It was supposed to be in the auditorium. We eventually ended up playing at the student center, right? Um, and before the gig, some of my friends, I actually, believe it or not, I knew a bunch of hardcore punks in college. And they were talking about their band or uh, about the band. Like, so what? what is, and I was like, oh, it's so ridiculous. They changed the name to Toymaker with two Ks that faced each other like this. So we're doing our performance and I look out in the audience and all of my friends are standing there going, woo, toy maker. <laughs> and I, I completely forgot what I was doing. I just lost it. I couldn't remember the words to any of the songs. Oh, no. <laughs> the rest of the band is like, what the hell's wrong with you? And I'm pointing at my friends and I think that they're going to be mad. And they're like, oh, we've got a gesture. It's the coolest thing ever. That's amazing. Um, but that was, that was, I was a terrible front man. I'm pretty comfortable with a guitar singing, 
but just standing there holding a microphone, I, I feel naked. So um, that whole thing was doomed to fail. But I love that incident. Hey, memory of Toymaker. I'm sorry if that's like a gang sign or something for somebody, but I thought I'm, that was hilarious. I'm assuming your tenure in the band Toymaker didn't last very long. Did they go on to do anything else? Did they replace no, they, you? Or? They, they split up pretty much immediately after that show. Not because of me, but because of the flaky drummer. Um, and I, I never saw any of those guys again. I got kicked out of college shortly after that because I wouldn't cut my hair. There's a real story for you. Um, the eighties, they were a more, uh, conservative time than, uh, than wow. we here. that's incredible. Thanks for that story. That's amazing. Toy macker. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. I'm going to Google them, see if anything pops up. You know, uh, luckily it was pre. now it would be all over YouTube and everything, especially people love fail videos, right? Uh, you know, luckily things like cell phone cameras were not a thing in 1987. <laughs> You're one foray into, uh. Into almost mega stardom with Toy Macker, yeah, is on, captured on camera. So good times. All right, what's something that you're very contrarian on? So literally everything. Um, th this is the way I think of contrarianism, right? I feel no peer pressure ever. I'm not affected by other people's opinions. I don't believe in group narrative, um, and that's really what it is when you talk about peer pressure. If you go to a group, and, and I'm not picking on people here, mm -hmm. it's just this is a group that I know of the name. If you go to Rush fans, uh, I guarantee you that there is a group narrative about the band Rush inside Rush fans, right? You're not going to go and be involved with Rush fans and be like, you know what? 2112 sucked. Because if you're that type of person, you can't be with that group. But at the same time, if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, and this happened to me in college, like, man, 2112 is the greatest rock album that ever happened. I'm like, no, you know what? Don't tell me what's great. I'm going to listen to it and decide for myself if it's great. And the harder people push, the more I find reasons to not like it. So that's mm. that's the contrarian element in me is I just just leave me alone. Now, I love it when I love being turned on to new music, mm -hmm. but I also feel no compunction about saying, you know what? Eh, I didn't care for it. Well, and there's something very admirable about that type of attitude, right? Too, right? Like, um, did you ever get into like big arguments or big fights with somebody? Uh, not fights, but uh, so this is the other way in which I'm contrary. And occasionally I like to poke the bear just because it pisses people off. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. I actually don't hate Ace Fraley. I do legitimately think Bruce Kulik's a better guitar player. But I like Israeli. I listened to 70s Kiss for years and years, right? But people get so mad when you say that Ace isn't the best guitar player in Kiss that I'm just like, you know what? Ace sucks because that's the kind of guy I am. The people in the comments love you, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure. Let Reed know that's... in the comments how much you love him. <laughs> no, we, we do love you. We And that's what makes the show great is when you have – different opinions and that was basically the basis of the show was having a different opinion and thinking outside right. the box so it's always amazing when people come on the show and we have different opinions and we can have cordial conversations with each other without raising voices and arguing and you know there's a um a spirited debate type of theme with our show which i appreciate a lot right but uh i don't right. think anything ever gets really heated on our show i think everybody there respects other people's opinions there are certain bands that the fans are particularly rabid, uh, Iron Maiden, um, Dream Theater. So kids, I don't like Dream Theater. Um, I can't stand Jane Labrie, James Labrie's voice. I think they're a bunch of noodly wankers that can't write a good song. I have never listened to a Dream Theater album that I enjoyed. And man, Dream Theater people are just like, ah! they're the best musicians ever. I'm like, okay, fine. You know what? I'm not saying they're not the best musicians. And John Myung, the bass player, he does a, a side group called um, The Jelly Jam with Ty Tabor from King's X. Love that band. Absolutely love it. So it's not that I'm opposed to anything they do. I just only like Dream Theater. But yeah, Dream Theater fans will get right up in your face and be like, how dare you not love this <laughs> band I love so much? 
Like I, I said, it. leave a comment in the uh, comment section. And uh, we have Reed Ever the Contrarian on our show here, continuing to be a contrarian on this show. So <laughs> um, what does production mean to you? Like album production? Uh, you know, for years and years, I didn't pay attention to production at all. That's really something that it kind of uh, talking about stuff with the contrarians has sort of opened my ears to that. So now uh, I still just think about it as the overall sound. But I don't have um, the sophistication of vocabulary that a, that a Martin has when he talks about production, right? So what I listen for now more than anything is the separation of instruments. Can I hear all of the instruments uh, at the levels I want? And like I've got a good friend and, and guitar teacher named Rob Garland. He's out in Los Angeles. And he sends me songs uh, that he's recorded and asked me to to give him feedback on the mix. And before I joined up with the contrarians, you know, my ears just weren't educated enough to do that sort of thing. But now I'm like, Rob, I think you're, think the bass is a little too high and you can push the guitar forward. So um, you can work, you know, the, your ears, believe it or not, are a trained skill. You can work on what you hear in music and uh, it, it makes it a very different experience. Wow. Yeah. I, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, like I wouldn't even have been able to tell you what production was four or five years ago before we started doing this channel and just listening right. to Martin and even folks like you and other folks that come on our show. Like um, now I, I used to think of, if I thought of anything at all, it would be, I like this song or I don't like this song or I like the guitar solo, just very surface level stuff. And right. I could tell the difference in quality. Like if I heard like a poorly recorded demo, versus a studio album cut or like a live track versus, you know what I mean? So I could tell the difference, like this kind of sounds not great and this sounds really good. But now, like, like you said, like I listen to music with a whole new set of ears. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And it changes the experience. It's, it's definitely uh, an interesting experience being a fan of music and exploring cool. that every, all kinds of genres and albums and production and stuff like that. But um, I've got a few, quick this or that questions that I'm going to throw at you. So this will be fun. You can answer them very quickly with a one word answer, or you can give us a bit of uh, uh, an answer if you like, that's up to you. And then we'll, uh, we'll see what else you got going on and we'll wrap it up. Are you ready? Yep. Rust in peace or countdown to extinction. Oh man, that's a good one. Um, you know what? I like countdown better. Uh, although Rust in Peace has my absolute favorite Megadeth composition, which is Tornado of Souls. I think that's the best song they ever recorded, The Height with Marty Friedman. But I really like Countdown to Extinction. Uh, as it turns out, I like my music just ever so slightly more accessible and less thrashy, right? What about like uh, Master of Puppets or Rust in Peace? Ooh, um, so I like the songs on Master. Here's a production question for you. I think Master of Puppets is muddy uh, and difficult to listen to. But um, I do like the songs, but I listen to Rust in Peace a hell of a lot more than I listen to Master of Puppets. Nice. Rust in Peace is classic. That was the album that got me in the Megadeth. Um, Non-makeup kiss or current lineup kiss? Ooh, uh, but I'm... I'm going non-makeup, but very specifically the Bruce Kulick era of non-makeup because I preferred it to the Mark St. John or the or I guess Vinnie Vincent was half and half, right? But uh, yeah, the uh, the Asylum, um, Crazy Nights era, love that. I, I do prefer them to the current era. Okay, I had this question in here. You kind of covered this early earlier, but uh, I know you're not an ace guy. Can you say something nice about ace? Oh, uh, I think Ace is probably the best Rolling Stones style guitar player in hard rock. Um, as long as he stays in that wheelhouse, I think he's great. I love his cover of 2000 Man on Dynasty. And if you listen to the original song, it doesn't sound anything like the Kiss cover, right? And then he's got a song on Unmasked, which I know is an unpopular album. Um, but he's got this song called Talk to Me. I think it's great, um, but I think he's just, you know, as long as he stays in that lane, I love him. On that note, are you a Stones or a Beatles guy? Beatles. Beatles all the way. Uh, one, because I love harmony. 
love harmony. That was what drew me into Alice in Chains first in the 1990s. I love harmony vocals. Uh, and the Beatles just had more complex songs than this. I mean, the Stones didn't even try to do complexity. They were going to be a blues-based rock band. And the Beatles had all the complex chords and harmony vocals. And they were just more interesting to listen to. Dehumanizer, Black Sabbath's third album, or um, Long Live Rock and Roll, Rainbow's third album? Hmm. <sighs> I am going long live rock and roll. I love Dehumanizer is another uh, production question. I love the songs on Dehumanizer, but it is really harsh and hard to listen to, I think. So um, long live rock and roll is is not as abrasive on my ears. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah, I can see. I think when I think of Dehumanizer, I think almost even, I don't know if it goes with the theme, but like almost a mechanical sounding type of album. And I can yeah. see how that, like industri industrial in some ways, even pre-industrial, like metal. Especially um, in the drums. Has that real harsh. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, 70s glam rock or 80s hair metal? Um. Wow. At this point in my life, I'm going 70s glam rock. Wow, interesting. Cool. In the, in the, uh, in the 80s, I would have gone 80s hair metal. What, what were some of your favorite, uh, like hair metal or, or glam metal bands in the 80s uh so i didn't like a lot of the like the motley crew type or quiet riot but i liked rat i liked Dawkin. um Wait, were you a poison fan no oh man See, really that, that's a, to me that's a, sorry that's a quick step a sidestep from like talk to me right uh it it is um quick story about poison when the poison album first came out this is this is a true story now. Small town in Montana. These guys, my friends bought the album and they're like, dude, check out this band. These four hot chicks are in this band. Sorry if you're offended by the <laughs> term hot chicks. And I was like, yeah, um, those are guys. So yeah, poison. They were never really uh never really my thing. But I did like Guns N' Roses when Guns N' Roses came out. Uh, if you consider them to be uh hair metal, as some people do. Fair enough. Um, Mob Rules the Song or Heavy Metal the Song from the Heavy Metal soundtrack? Mob Rules the Song. Although, <laughs> if you're talking about the he the Sammy Hager Heavy Metal, uh, that's a fun song. But, man, Mob Rules still has my all-time favorite introduction, especially if you have it in, in where it's got E5150, which, by the way, just spells evil. In case you didn't anybody hasn't noticed that so you have that instrumental uh opening and then ronnie dio screaming oh come on and it goes into that crushingly heavy riff i mean that is the literal moment that i became a heavy metal fan listening to that i freaking love that it is so ingrained in my dna fighting for the earth or the Candyman album Oh, man, I got to go fighting for the earth. <laughs> it's so much less disturbing than that Candyman album. But check it uh, out. I got to look. I got to look up the Candyman. Uh, last one, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Right. Do you like close to live as possible on a live album or dubbed over tracks at the studio to make it sound better? <sighs> do you like the presentation better or do you want to hear the authentic live recording? No, I, I want to hear a good recording. So my my take on it for live albums is in the 70s, live albums always sounded better than studio albums. Of course, we learned later that mostly they, that was because they were doctored up in the studio, right? By the 80s, they were functionally the same. And in the 90s, studio albums, production had reached the point where studio albums sound better than live albums. So I love live albums from the 70s, and I think those are the ones that have been doctored. After right. that, might as well just listen to the studio album. Other than that, Reed, uh, I know that you jump on other folks' channels. Do you got anything else coming up that you want to talk about? Um, I don't know exactly if I'm scheduled for anything. Uh, people have been generous enough to invite me. I was the first guest with Peter Kerr on Rock Daydream Nation. Um, uh, Grant Arthur on Grant's Rock Warehouse has, has uh, done several videos, usually because... Um, I suggest weird content. Like I was the one that suggested that we do the cure and we just finished up a, a section on the cure. We did the doors. We're going to do the sisters of mercy in a while um, because uh, goth rock is, is a part of my past. Um, 
but I think that's, that is it. I, um, said, I'm always willing to, to collaborate with people. Um, we'll say there, there is one contrarian who asked me if I wanted to do something. And I said, Oh, I, I really can't do that. And I think it offended him. Um, but it, it wasn't because I didn't want to collaborate with him. It was just the, the specific thing he asked about the timing was off. Gotcha. Well, you're definitely one one of our esteemed members of our panels, and you can always catch Reed either hosting or joining one of our chats. And we totally appreciate all the support that Reed's done. He's he's actually um, reached out and seen if he can help out on the channel in other ways, and he's been kind of doing things for us. So that's absolutely amazing. We appreciate everything you've done and your opinions and bringing different opinions and thinking outside the box, you know, not for the, just for the reason of being contrarian, like you have authentic and genuine points of views. And we, we appreciate that a lot, Reed. And well, uh, thanks for being on our show. Thank you very much. Even if people hate my opinions, I hope they're entertained, you know, cause I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. I just hope they, I hope they enjoy the chats. All right. Other than that, thanks, Reed. If you want to give us a like and subscribe, then hit the bell and subscribe and we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks a lot, Marco. All right. Thanks, Reed.